morning, everyone. <clears throat> How are you guys doing? <laughs> Hi. Whew, it's getting cold, right? And yeah, obviously, you know. Um, for those who are interested, the Healing Center project <laughs> starts showing up a little bit, like a few rooms already, and um, we're progressing. I hope maybe New Year we can make it in the living room at some point. So how are you guys doing so far? How was the preparation for Christmas? You guys, everybody has a Christmas tree. Do you guys make events? Is your doc ready for it? <clears throat> we're not saying anything. Is your coffee ready, by the way? So I was super excited last time. We had awesome questions from every one of you. Thank you, you too. Um, where are you guys from today? So I am in Eugene, uh, Oregon. That's in West Coast of um, USA. So I know some of you are from further away. Um, so tell me a little bit about where you're from. Tell me a little bit about your dog. Tell me a little bit about your goals this week. Or, you know, um, what you guys from? Hi, Chris from Illinois. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, Selena. I'm so I'm I'm so grateful for you guys being here. Um, your questions um, help me better understand what you guys are struggling with. With your questions, sometimes I'm triggered to kind of like, oh right, um, those are things that people are struggling with. And you know, I have my experiences, and uh, you know, everybody has his own experience around dogs. I share my my personal approach in behavior modification, I call it holistic dog training and holistic parenting, because <clears throat> I believe dogs are sentient beings and they have free will. We should respect that. And I also believe that we cannot just condition dogs to do things just because we want them to. I feel there's a, there's a deeper meaning into helping dogs acclimate and and feel comfortable in our environment it does not come just with conditioning we, we need to create a safe environment for them we have to build a relationship with them we have to have them share their emotions and we have to share our emotions because bottom line dogs are emotional beings they're emotional intelligence science already confirms we're talking about comparing dogs with ten, uh, seven year old, six year old children, plus minus. <laughs> um, and we, we know that dogs have basic core emotions like fear, uh, obviously, duh. And then um, some people even question that dogs have guilt. Now, <clears throat> I, I see it and I was one of those people <clears throat> on like, yeah, that's BS, you know. Dogs don't feel guilty. It's just what the body looks like. It's our translation, what it looks like. But over the years, I've seen the dogs do feel emotions like guilt because there is a job description and they have to be compliant to family systemics and, and family code of conduct if, if they live with their own families. And if they're not compliant, it will have consequences. And if they are not compliant to those rules, they, they ask for forgiveness, forgiveness. I mean, we, we make forgiveness being kind of something very spiritual and, and very um, like, let's say religious, but it's actually a social thing. Um, so Chris shares, my dogs have been together since they were puppies. Now they want to fight every time they walk by each other. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, good question. So I'll get to that. Let's talk about that a little bit. Meanwhile, um, where you guys are from? I see we are 10 people here, like in the very beginning. I hope everybody has his coffee. Everybody have fed your dogs. I just be done with it. So let's look a lot, a little bit into why dogs, um, feel the need to get in fights. And um, I remember <coughs> wow. 
What was that? Okay, so no advertising here, right? <laughs> I see there somebody has some um, advertising coming in. Nope, we don't do that. So those apps are going away. Thank you guys, I saw it. Okay, so Lord Lynn is from Mariposa. Ooh, I don't know where it is. California, I love it. From Arkansas, Wisconsin, love it. I, I love Wisconsin. I've been there once, I remember in the very beginning um, and that was a very awesome experience because I never, back then I just moved from Europe. I had no clue about, you know, the, the, the lifestyle. And I, I remember being there for vacation at Lake Minocqua and all these people were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the woods and trees for me you us was kind of like a land of cowboys and indians um i was very lucky though to change my mind pretty quickly um and that was a very 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 nice experience so uh mariposa is uh, just oh you know what i was close there i almost i almost went to do camping there with my rv on our way down to oregon so Let's start with a couple of questions here. Um, I still have to delete a couple of stuff that popped up here. You know, once we get popular, people show up and try to do, you know, spam stuff. So let's go to Chris a little bit. Okay, let me check in on that. Um, give me a second. You know, I hate this. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, while I'm trying to figure these things out here, um, ask your questions and I'll put them all together and we're gonna answer them first come, first serve. Okay, I got this sorted out. So let's, from, from my experience, there, there are five reasons why dog get in disputes. And I would like to discuss a little bit all those reasons because I believe I believe it's important that before we take sides on a dog who gets in fights, we should be aware that dogs get in disputes because they are mammals. They do have issues with each other. They do get in trouble. They do get um, 
in in conflict situations because they have emotions and so we have to make sure um, that we are aware of the family dynamics so there are multiple reasons why dogs get in disputes and let's start with age so dogs have ages that are going through because they are, they establish their social interactions and they need to learn from that so sometimes they do things they like and then other dogs don't like it some dogs want to learn from how they express themselves in other situations and other dogs don't like it and so if we have multiple dogs in the household we should become aware that we should be the reference point and i don't want to come from that perspective and say yeah you know it's about you know pack hierarchy and uh, it's about the um, fact that you know there is a dominance thing and don't take me wrong and i don't want you to throw you off the clouds but that dominance thing does not really exist okay it exists in some theories that were never confirmed um with science um it was a misinterpretation in the early um, in the late 50s, early 60s, and we came in from humanizing certain behaviors, and that just escalated. So I remember there was there were two Swiss scientists who actually started talking about this dominance theory, observing wolves in captivity in a zoo in, in, in Swiss. What does a zoo have to do with reality in my case? And and I was very frustrated when I learned about it, because I was in the same leg, you know, pack theory and, you know, dogs have packs and, and they establish dominance. And, and one day um, I didn't walk up smart, you know, I, I learned, I read about stuff and I started digging because I wanted to know who started it because something didn't end up. I, I something didn't seem right to me. I used to work in Greece, um, volunteered with, um, free roaming dogs and I was able to observe you know their mentality working with each other and playing with each other they're not getting in fights all the time they're not establishing pack hierarchy you know they don't they're not packs they they have quite complex social interactions and I'm sorry I'm I'm taking so wide angle because I just need you to understand <clears throat> then at some point we need to recognize that if we let dogs just be dogs without education, they're gonna explore the breed traits and they're gonna explore the social interactions as much as they know. So if they don't know, they get in fights and there's some nothing to stop them until somebody wins. And then we're going to this zoo situation, right? And even if dogs coming from the same litter does not mean that they're semi-programmed. We don't know what the previous situation was. We don't know how the breeder educated them. We don't know how long they were with their, with their, with their family. And I, and I prefer to use the word family over pack because unlike other animals, the reason why they're so special to us is because they were able to adapt just like wolves in our family systems. They have similar family systems. So to, to break it down a little bit, dogs have a matriarchic family system. So meaning is the mother, is organizing the family she organizes the puppy she is basically in charge of the well-being of the puppies obviously at the very beginning and the males are not second they're also first so um, the other com complex thing that people confuse is when they call them the alphas oh the dog wants to establish himself as an alpha this is not right because the term alpha stems from breeding practices and we call the alphas the alpha female and the alpha male from the breeding pair so the original breeding pair which we would we would call parents of those litters is the alpha male and the alpha female now what's that if one of those litter mates or those you know parents mate with one of their sons the mother will be the alpha female mating with one of her offsprings or if the male father mates with one of the offsprings then it would be the alpha male 
mating with one of his offsprings. So that doesn't change the status because they're still the parents, no matter how long those lines go down. And usually dogs don't stay closer than 13 dogs in a group, in a family group, because there are problems coming up. For example, food and location and safety. So at some point, those dogs will move away from the family and create their own family. So we see the f group fluctuate between two, three, usually three, and 13 dogs. And don't take me kind of like on, on, on a pedestal on the 13, but usually based on science and friends that I, I have that look very closely and, and study those kind of behaviors told me that this is the maximum group I've seen, 13 dogs max, because it depends on, on the time of the year there are. And yes, they have fights with each other. They last very short, you know, disputes were cleared out. It could be a relationship dispute. It could be um, a frustration dispute. And you know what? Let me pull up that screen for you because I actually put it together so you guys can see it. Um, and and why not sharing with you? You, you, you deserve to know. And, and I would like you guys, I don't want you to take for granted what I'm telling you here because it's not just me you know, being right. I, I'm just, everybody has his point of view. I'm coming more from a scientific perspective. Um, and, and I would like you to, um, I would like you to have discernment if things come up and, and you should know and you should understand and not always take for granted what everybody tells you. I would question it. So my what I would show you right now it's not the solution to your problem, but it gives you a better understanding why we have those issues with our dogs. Okay, let me open that up for you here because I would like you to see it. Goodbye, here they go. And I'm gonna share your screen, a screen with you. Where is that? Um, here you go. How about that? Feels better? Okay, so five reasons why dogs get in disputes so you guys can take screenshots, okay? So the first one that I perceive is excitement disputes. It doesn't matter if the dogs are from the same family or they're separate. Um, they can come from, from an adoption or they can be rescues. So excitement is the number one. It happens when people are around. It happens when new things happen suddenly. So too much excitement gets the dogs to switch either to mating or hunting drive because excitement is a fuel. Imagine like a fuel. If you have too much fuel in it from excitement, it can switch into anxiety and anxiety becomes an issue. Okay. So the next thing that I see here is frustration disputes. So frustration disputes are very simple to explain. A dog doesn't have a resolution to his problem. He gets excited about it, okay? And then he gets aggravated. And despite of any efforts, he wants to resolve his problem. He doesn't get any help from his environment. And then that frustration is has to be directed somewhere. So usually we have these um, dogs who are chewing, digging, attacking each other because of that frustration. He cannot get to the neighbor's dog. You get redirected aggression, okay? Then we have possession disputes, okay? And I understand where people says, yeah, that's resource guarding. You know, it's kind of a broad term resource guarding. Possession dispute is something very specific. I have something in my possession. It could be a territory. It could be an item. It could be a relationship. And the dog wants to protect that value over another dog or a person. So, and for example, possession dispute usually has a traumatic experience as a source, as well as frustration disputes. If a dog doesn't have a learned social skills and coping mechanism, and it doesn't have troubleshooting skills. And as example with excitement disputes, the dog energetic system gets overwhelmed with things and it doesn't know what to do with it, right? And so possession disputes, um, have to do with how the dog perceives the situation. It could be even food that usually you change or a fresh bag of potato chips he just got. And so if the dog has lack of social skills and lack of um, troubleshooting skills, he may end up in a dispute because he doesn't know how to handle that situation and another dog will get him in trouble. And then we have balance and rule disputes. Don't underestimate 
the consciousness of dogs understanding a law and the natural law. So people misunderstand because they try to take the dog's sock away from his mouth, okay, and reprimand the dog for doing so. And then all of a sudden the neighbor dog comes over or your second dog comes over and attacks your dog. Why do you think is that happening? Because he sees there is an injustice. The dog did something he's supposed not to do based on your family code of conduct, and you are reprimanding the dog. You don't see your dog suddenly change behavior and he becomes kind of violent in his emotions, and the other dog comes in to step in and help you, and you don't see it coming, and all of a sudden you have a fight over balance and rule disputes. So that injustice, and you see, you know, I, I actually do choose that picture of a police dog because we need to understand that a dog has a common, has a good sense of justice. Even cows have sense of justice. I've seen a cow attacking another person who got violent to a third person. And you always have to question that dogs and animals perceive justice and violence. And then one is very common that I see in my practice as a holistic dog trainer and behaviorist because I work also internationally. We see that communication disputes are very, very, very common. Dogs and people misinterpret situations. They don't understand the emotional language. They don't understand, you know, the way um, the, the, the dog tries to show, you know, his discomfort and they end up in trouble, right? Do you guys have any questions to that so far? Now let's let's get a little bit here. Um, okay, so if you guys have any questions, good time to that aspect, um, answering the question of Chris. Let's pull that question up again. So why they were puppies, now they want to fight every time they walk by each other. I used to take them for dog parks and every place together. Now I'm scared to take them anywhere. I can't even have them in the same room. One is a pit and the other one is a shepherd mastiff. So we see, and it's a it's a misconception that it's, oh, that's what, you know, pit does, or that was a shepherd does. So I see, I don't know who started, and it's difficult for me to answer that, but I'm you're welcome to private message me and we can talk about that um, and, and break it down in, in a behavior assessment and understand why does every dog does anything. And we want to make sure that we capture the, all the environmental factors that happen here. Because, you know, you have to see a breed as the genetic and environment. And so the breed behaviors, the individual dog's behaviors depends on the genetics and on the environmental factors. And from what I saw and, and tried to research so far, science fluctuates between 42% genetics and 60% genetics that affect the dog's behavior. And from 58% uh, and up, the environmental factors. What I have seen in home pets is that gen genetics are about 42% give it a number, I, I'm more inclined to believe the 42% and 58% environmental factors because if you see a dog being on his own, he will show his breed traits to the full extent. As soon as the environment kicks in and can put this in the frame, then these behaviors are adjusted. Does a dog behave like a dog? Of course he does. That's his genetics. He behaves like a dog. But a dog can behave also like a cat. A cat can behave like a dog. She would not bark like a dog, but her behavior can be similar because the environment influenced that cat or that dog to adjust his behavior according to the environmental factors that will help him survive and thrive. So in nature, they only go to survive at that point, but in a pet home environment, they tend to thrive because they don't have all those dangers exposed. And that one makes a big difference. So why your dogs fight with each other? My first guess, and it's just a guess, a, a, a consultation would be more helpful. We recognize that something happened in the past that you didn't see it. Something happened in the past as puppies that the one was more controlling as the other dog. There were disputes working in the background and 
the dogs didn't trust you to solve those problems for them. You intervened in the problems, but you didn't adjust the problems. And so they start fighting with each other, trying to clearing out those situations. Now, can you fix it? Yes. Can you make it disappear? No. At that point, I don't know. I, I need to need more information for that. But what I usually see is that people start blaming the one dog or the other and taking sides and, and projecting behaviors that are really not there and, and, and they are reactive to those behaviors instead of seeing the root of those behaviors. And then, and then they act accordingly, so they are reactive. So a person who is reactive to two dogs' disputes will make things worse. A person who is proactive and the dog recognizing there is there is a management here and things aren't being taken care of, they usually fight less. So first of all, if we work together at some point um, in time and, and, and you follow a protocol that I have for that cases, you will see that we have three stages. The first one is the assessment. The second one is the transition time. And the fourth one is the, main, the maintenance. And we have also to consider that there are traumas involved that we don't know so far that happened in the past that we don't know so far. Um, and some dogs carry a lot of baggage, luggage, I guess, um, from those past experiences before they come to the house that you are not aware of. So there, there are different things that we can do. I, ho I hope that helps you so far. So um, Jennifer, I love your questions. Oh, I need some coffee. <laughs> so. Um, my puppy is nine weeks old, and she's a great Pyrenees, and my and my first dog. Ooh, <laughs> you got the love on your plate. He doesn't want to be alone ever. Oh, you have separation anxiety. How do I teach him it's okay? I have five children at home plus my husband. Okay. So what I usually see, we, we expect a lot of a puppy. So a nine-week-old puppy is really young. He, he, he cannot live on his own. Of course, he will be never be alone because he's scared of being alone. So we want to teach the puppy how to be alone. And we want to be very careful how we transmit that information because the puppy, for, for the puppy to be alone, he has to learn to en en entertain himself. So we want to teach him entertainment, right? So leave a child alone. Like you have, you have five children. How, how would that work for you for a couple of months old child to be alone for a while and you walk away? The first thing he's going to get is a cry. And I know, you know, Jennifer, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a f female and I have ne never raised children myself from, from early childhood. But if a child cries, it really aches. I cannot have a child crying. I feel pain like emotional pain about that because I, I'm an empath and I feel that pain of the child. So I need to comfort the child. I'm not saying you shouldn't comfort the child and don't say you shouldn't comfort the baby but or, or a dog. But what I would like you to understand is there should be a transition time from the puppy needs and wants. What is a need? What is a want? Do I comply to this puppy needs. First of all, my first question is, my dog has a need for food, for care, protection, comfort, nourishment. Are these needs met? Does your puppy actually get enough food? And so if the puppy doesn't get enough food and enough nutrients because of the bad quality food, and I know many people want to choose best quality food, but sometimes that thing doesn't work well because those companies lie to you. So you don't really know what you're getting. And even if your best effort going to more expensive food, you're still in a trap. They don't tell you what it is. And your puppy's suffering and is fearful all the time. And now he learns that every time there is a problem, you are there to take care of it. Now, sometimes we don't have that access. So we have to create that transition to first of all, meet the puppy's needs. We have all those on the checklist, okay? And we have all those on the checklist checked. He went to the bathroom, he does this, now he whines. Why does he whine? Oh, he wants to be with us. Okay, how does this happening? So we have conditioned responses. So we teach the puppy that we are always accessible 
And now the puppy wants access and we deny access. And now all of a sudden the puppy becomes fearful because he believes you are dumping the puppy. You don't like the puppy anymore. So we want to teach the puppy that distance and disappearance does not mean neglect. So you have to, and I know it because it's your first puppy. I highly recommend, I have, I have this parenting mentoring classes they are individual because each dog is individual and I, i'm happy to, to walk you through that concept of being a guardian breeds parent which is kind of complex because as pets they don't have specific jobs and as pets in a household they're in a different environment they were bred for so you have multiple things going on at the same time and especially as, uh, as, as Great Pyrenees who are guardian breeds, there, there should be um, a learning curve from my, my parent I have to be with and my family be protected because you have a guardian breed. So if the dog gets this the wrong message, the only thing will happen is he will guard you even before your children later. And you don't want that. And your dog will do the right job because he will start guarding you, protecting you, because you are the only source of information, right? And your children will be on the second line. And if your children wants your attention, your puppy starts becoming guardian you. So I, I recommend, maybe you want to message me on that and um, you know, do a couple of sessions. Usually my, my mentoring package is five sessions long. It lasts about a month. and gives you all the information that you need until your puppy is 16 months old. And then usually, you know, we have some adjustments over time, depending on the breed traits. I, ho I hope that helps you so far. So um, next question, Lindsay, have you ever had a situation when once a goofy, playful dog becomes fun? <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know what breed of dog you have, but usually um, herding dogs, even if it's a mixed breed, um, they see, that they start recognizing that excitement is not appreciated. So what they do is every time the excitement raises to a certain level, they do excitement policing and they go after the dogs. So guarding breeds and guardian breeds are likely to be more receptive to imbalances in excitement control. And so they will do that. So what I would suggest, uh, and they're not going after, after dogs only, they also go after kids. So kids that yell, screaming, friends coming over and behave inappropriately. That dog is like right there in their face, barking his fat off. And if we do the wrong thing and we don't educate the kids, that that level of play is not socially acceptable because those children, I'm not, I'm not giving you a parenting lecture here, but it's something you should consider that, Children learn to be social with children, so same age. And so if they don't know how to regulate their emotions and how they yell and scream and fight about things, how would they do this later in life? I'm not saying we, we should pressure children not to express themselves, but I also would recommend to see if a dog responds to their excitement level there is something energetically wrong into that, usually. I'm not saying your dog is Mr. Perfect and Mr. Psychologist, but usually I see a combination where people are like, yeah, they're just kids playing around, and the dog is like, they are aggressive, mom. <laughs> you know? So um, I would not ignore your dog's message first, but I would not also ignore your dog's tendencies to control situation he's supposed not to. So your dog needs a little bit of help recognizing what's the upper limit, what is acceptable. So this is where classical conditioning comes handy after we establish you know, the family code of conduct, what to do and what not to do. And if the kid's screaming and yelling in the pool, for the dog it's challenging and he needs to understand that what he perceives as challenge is no problem at all. They're just fine. They can swim in the water because people swim, even if they scream and yell. But you know what, kids? How about you kind of cut it off a notch? Because if you scream and yell for no reason, if you really need it, I would not know that you are in need and you're going to end up in a problem, right? So, um, Lindsay, I hope that answered your question. So, who's next? 
next in line, Jennifer. He also doing a lot of puppy, but he, of course he does. So a question on this one, and I've seen this all the time, it's kind of like a puppy boom right now. Um, how much food do you feed your dog? What brand are you feeding? How much do you feed your dog? What's the quality of that food? And how many times do you feed per day? Please, people, feed your puppy four times a day. The recommended food amount plus 30%. Because if you read the fine print on those bags, that puppy food, obviously, that you're feeding or you're supposed to feed puppy food, puppy. And I know many people come in and like, yeah, my dog is a large breed puppy and I'm supposed not to feed him puppy food. What the nonsense is that? Why do, we, why do you think veterinary nutritionists created puppy food because especially large breed puppy food because they comply to these large breed needs okay and don't come in like my dog shouldn't eat so much protein because it grows faster the formulation has to be appropriate and you cannot just cut out protein because from a balanced food the balance in itself is what is the nutrients if you start cutting numbers there and you have no clue what you're doing and it will not show up right away, it shows up later. And then you have a problem and you're like, oh man, that Roman hat was right. So um, you guys who are in my Facebook group, uh, Holistic uh, Dog Parenting and Training, um, we have a chapter right there in, in, the, in the units that explains to you scientific evidence, you know, it's not my ideas, and break it down why large breed puppies have to feed differently, okay? And they should feed large breed puppy food. Um, okay, I think, so to deal with that appropriately, you have to first control the puppy needs. Does he have enough nutrients? Is food the reason why he's biting a lot? Because he wants to communicate. Because puppy's mouth is a hand for your, of your child, for example. What your child does with his hands, your puppy does with his mouth. How does your pup, your child tells you, mommy, 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 let me show you something. She grabs by your hand and pulls you over to show you that thing that just came at the door. He doesn't know how to call it, right? And your dog, what he does, he grabs your hand because he's hungry. He wants you to do something with your hands that he needs because he knows you do things with, his, with your hands while he does things with his mouth. And the other thing that I also see with people very, very often do is they manhandle their dogs. Oh, cute puppy, and we'll lift the puppy. Oh my God, my puppy takes something and they grab the sock out of his mouth. These are violent actions for a puppy. You just don't do that. First of all, your puppy should be safe in his home. A sock should not be on the floor. And whatever is on the floor is safe for a puppy. There shouldn't be no reason for you to try to take something away from the puppy. It shouldn't be in his mouth. You wouldn't do that to a child either. Okay, so you make safe puppy environment. If that is a confined area, I'm, I'm not a fan of crates, but sometimes if you don't have other options than confinement in a room or in a dedicated area, like a playpen, well, crate is another option, but you know what? Crate is not the solution to everything because we need still to educate the puppy what he can have and what not. So don't let him chew on a sock if you don't want him to chew on socks later. So you want to give him dedicated puppy toys and um, enrichment toys that are safe for puppies and they are toxin free. And I would definitely go to children toys that are non-toxic colors, non-toxic material, PPA free. You know, you can, you can Google it around a little bit. I think I have an, uh, um, in our group um, a unit about that. If not, please, please forgive me. I'm going to post something about it. Okay. So, um, wow. Time goes fast. Um, do you know about Shepherd, Malinois Shepherds? I it's okay, no problem. It happens to me all the time. That Malinois thing, spelling check is like really bad. So yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't train Malinois police dogs, but I do um, love their temperament. They're very high strong dogs. They are very work oriented, definitely not the first timer dog. And if you have one, I see many times people uh, come in very aggressively because they're shepherds, because they are using in police dog training. So they use prong collars, shock collars, and boot camps. Come on, guys. No matter what breed he is, he's an emotionally intelligent dog. He needs parenting and he does need the boot camp. 
okay? He's not a military person. He's not a military dog. These are completely different dimensions. So um, proper education, early socialization, perfect breed specific enrichments. And you know, Belgium and Yuam are herding dogs. So they tend to bite, okay? They tend to control through bite and, and, and through manipulation. So if you don't teach your dog early um, morals and ethics, and I would not focus so much on obedience, focus more on morals and ethics first, obedience comes automatically and you just need to name it. So you just need to put, you know, um, labels on it and the dog will perform. So I hope that uh, is the question you were looking for. So Lindsay, my dogs who have previous disputes, what are your experiences with getting back to the baseline or does it permanently change the dynamic? What with dogs who have had previous disputes? So, you know, if you don't realize you resolve the problem that they're original fight, so there's an underlying issue there. It could be that one dog is more needy than the other one and the other dog doesn't like it. So there's something happening in the background emotionally that you don't see. And that's why, you know, doing doing a consultation, that would, that would give you a lot of information. Yeah, hi, Steve. Oh, Steve, oh, we're seeing each other in 10 minutes. Steve is um, a fellow colleague and holistic behaviorist for National Great Pyrenees Rescue, and he runs the behavior team um, for them in um, Ohio. So, hi, Kimberly. Yeah, okay, let's do that next. Well, yeah, Chris, that, that confirms the story. You're welcome, Jennifer. Yeah, welcome to private message me, guys. You know, I don't want that to be a sales pitch, but at some point your complex behaviors, it's not being sold on Facebook over a short chat because those questions can be um, very, very difficult because I only hear your versions. I, I don't, I need to do my tests on your dog. I can do this remotely. I don't need to be in person there. Uh, what's the best dog food? Well, the best dog food for dogs is the one that is as healthy as possible on the main ingredients. Healthy proteins, healthy primary ingredients. Um, I don't really like to see um, meals, but you know, somewhere we want to be inexpensive. I would go, uh, generally my, my, my idea is raw feeding, but properly done, okay? Not just going to Facebook groups and follow the rules you know, the, most of those have no scientific evidence. They just come up with plans. Oh, we're going to feed the dog wolf diet. Like, what the bark are you talking about? I don't have a wolf. I have a dog who is 40,000 years in the human environment and wolves are not. Okay. Are we eating like apes? No, we don't. So why would I feed a dog wolf diet? Ancestors diet. What ancestors are you talking about? Sorry, I got a rant. <laughs> so... Yeah, raw feeding, yes, but you want to breed species, spe uh, species, no, species slash breed specific diet. Dogs, for example, who are Nordish breeds have a different diet than dogs who are, you know, in the desert. Dogs who are in Germany or born and bred in Germany will have different nutritional needs than those who are bred in China. I'm you know, Chinese Mastiffs, you know, Creston, um, Chihuahuas. Huskies, German Shepherds, you know, guardian guardian breeds in Asia. They, all these things are different menus, and, and their the, their genetics are different, you know, configured. So that is my nutritional advice so far. But however, I've seen for you guys who are convenience feeder slash kibble feeders, I would go to a low temperature cooked food that is cooked not longer than eighty seconds, usually around two hundred fifty degrees. Uh, 240 degrees the first ingredient should be meat proteins okay any any proteins like chicken duck beef uh, going to this super fancy crocodile and and you know <laughs> kangaroo diets it's an option but it's not a solution if you go to those because you have a digestive issue problems there are other issues there are many nutritionists out there that i highly recommend you should reach out for and talk to them so they can put a menu together that's appropriate to your dog. Unfortunately, I, I have to say veterinarians do not have nutritional education. It's very minimal. And they usually reach out to those super extreme brands like Hills and 
um, uh, Royal Canine and all these crap brands that basically just package systems so they can sell them. Anyway, don't get me started with that food. So I personally, uh, my first on the top of the list will be Canaan Caviar, uh, would be a Cana. I know some people freak out right now. It's okay. No, bro, it's my, it's not your problem. Um, origin, open farms. Um, if you want to go cheaper, don't compare just price tags on bags to really comparison cups per day cost per cup per day that's your number you want to look for comparing with nutrient density and comparing with nutritional quality okay you can find the cheap food you're gonna end up being one dollar a day or 99 cents per day per cup per meal for a hundred pound dog and you go to an expensive food what like like 60 70 dollar bag food you have to feed less that dog you have to feed less cups per day to feed those nutrient requirements, and you're going to end up 1.45 cents, $1.45, which is ridiculous compared that one bag will be twice as expensive than the small bag. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like, what, for only 46 cents per day more for a 100-pound dog? Yeah, because high-quality value food has more net nutrient density. The dog needs more food and does need so much caps per day versus the cheap food and he fits healthier so yeah you can feed with one and a half dollars a day a dog 400 pounds okay um terry yeah you know what they're, they're great dogs but you need to know where where those dogs are coming from because if if you want to get a rescue it's a great thing to do. I love, you know, people who work with rescues and adopt rescues out. Um, but you need to know a lot if you get a rescue dog uh, of that caliber. Um, I would definitely get him from a reputable rescue that has evaluation, that has a good background check, that knows exactly the history of the dog as much as possible. So you don't end up in a disaster trying, you know, to get your hands wet with that dog. You're welcome, Terry. Yeah, Selena, exactly. So thank you so much, guys. I need to go. Um, I hope I didn't miss anyone. How, how did you like our Q&A today? I like it, and my coffee's empty. And yeah, if you guys need help, uh, if you need any help, you're welcome to message me. Exactly. I, I say people, feeding is an investment, an investment that stays at your house. Cheap feeding is an investment to vet care, insurance companies. Okay, that's where you're investing. So I prefer to invest in my own dogs in my own house. And doesn't mean you don't go to the vet. Of course, you go to the vet for your regular checkups. But I would say, you know, feed healthy has less problems. Food can cause aggression. It doesn't cause food aggression per se in specific, but food can cause aggression. A dog who's hungry is likely to kill someone to eat. A dog, a cat, you know. Um, dogs don't eat dogs, but well, it was a wrong example. But dogs will kill to eat if they don't get nutrients from their food. So therefore, dog food affects behavior and therefore behavior can escalate frustration causes aggression and all of a sudden we're in a vicious circle you don't feel healthy you put your dog in a problem so thanks a lot thank you everyone uh, for your questions and next saturday um i'm not having a christmas session like next saturday what's what is look for hold on give me a second uh come on phone be cooperative here stop telling me everything here we go. Um, next Saturday, the 12th, right here again. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.